Cooper is back with a vengeance! The Mini Cooper, made famous in the 60s for so many race and rally successes, is just one of the many hundreds of cars rushing from all over the world to take part in Motor Show 90. Oh, by the way, not all the parking's as easy as this. At Birmingham this year, the emphasis is on selling. In the seven NEC halls, there are 340 stands representing 40 countries. But of course, the UK car market at the moment isn't particularly healthy. Last month, it was down 13.5%, and the figures for 1990 so far, down 12.5%. So the salesmen here really are super keen to move all this metal. However, having said that, things are not at all depressed because Birmingham is one month earlier this year, it's now ahead of Paris. And it means that all the major manufacturers are choosing the NEC to launch some very exciting new models. Ford have abandoned their traditional stand in Hall 2 and they've moved to this modest little emporium at the back of Hall 4. Now, believe it or not, this stand is half the size of the pitch at Wembley Stadium. There's 86 cars on display here in this multi-million pound venture. And a lot of the stand space is given over, of course, to Ford's new offering, the Escort. There's a big display of Ford's sporting heritage, their race and rally winning saloons. They're also showing some concept cars, what they think we'll all be driving in the next century. This is Zig, a charming little sports car. Its compatriot over there is Zag, which is a, an all-purpose recreational vehicle. Looks like a very small bread van. The point is they're both constructed on the same chassis and they share the same power plant. That means they're very cheap to manufacture and they're strongly tipped as the cars Ford management would most like to make in the coming years. Of course, the big news on the Ford stand is the new Escort and Orion Ranges. The Escort's been the UK's best-selling car for the last eight years, of course, and it's also been a worldwide bestseller for eight of the last nine years. Not a lot of people know that. Now, Ford has spent an astonishing £1 billion on the new Escort and Orion. The cars don't look spectacularly different. It isn't like when the Sierra replaced the old Cortina, but then of late, Ford have tended to be rather cautious and conservative. But there's some nice fine-tuning both inside and out, and I think they look a little sharper than they did. They've added a few inches widthways and in the height, and it's more aerodynamically sound too. Very steeply raked windscreen, and because that could cause a problem with the inside of the car getting a bit hot, they've paid a lot of attention to ventilation, and in fact, air conditioning is an optional extra in the top of the range models. Inside the car, the fascia has been remodelled, but not enough to frighten any Ford aficionados. And the seats have been remoulded, so they do feel very comfortable. There's a nice little extra in the top of the range cars, too, that the steering column moves for you. It should be a more comfortable ride altogether, because they've repositioned the wheels, as they did with the Fiesta, to provide better tracking. And they've paid more attention to car security this time, too. There's a similar range of engines as before, but no price rise. But then Ford have had three price rises over the last 12 months, so they're not exactly due for one. So a 1400 version of this will set you back about nine and a half thousand. In a nutshell, Clio is a big car refinement for the small car sector.
This is Renault's new Super Mini, the Clio. Eventually, it'll replace the Renault 5, although cheaper versions of the old 5 will be on sale for some time. Went on sale in France of June of this year, but we won't see it in the UK until March next year. Renault say this marks the point at which they stop calling cars with numbers. They start giving them names, although for those of us old enough to remember the old Dauphine, that'll come as no surprise. We've already got the Charmade. The Clio has the fashionable drooping rear roof line to give it a very aerodynamic shape, a teardrop, although that does reduce headroom in the back of the car. All new interior, new fascia, and nice seats with supporting edges for the driver. Comes with 1.2, 1.4 and 1.8 litre petrol engines and a 1.9 litre diesel. Now to beat the Golf GTI 16 valve, they've got their own 140 brake horsepower 16 valve model on sale shortly. When in 1984 Nissan set up their factory in China Weir to produce the Bluebird, the decision was received with mixed emotions because although the jobs were much needed in a depressed area of the northeast, it was seen as a poorly disguised move to actually get round the quota system to get more Nissan cars onto the European market. Now with the introduction of the Nissan Primera range, things ought to be very different because this is very much a European car. This is the LS, which comes right in the middle of the seven-car model range. There are three different body styles and two new engines, a 1.6-litre and a 2-litre. And although Nissan are probably not too happy with the comparison, it has to be said that the Primera bears a striking resemblance to the Cavalier. And that's no bad thing, really, because Nissan must be aiming not just at the private buyer, but also at the fleet market. The company are very proud of the aerodynamic shape of the Primera. And unlike the Clio, they've continued the roof line high all the way to the rear, so the rear seat passengers get the maximum amount of headroom. Nissan are claiming an 80% local content, and they're hoping to export 60% of the cars they produce. What is certainly going to be interesting in the future is to see whether Honda and Toyota also care to do a Nissan. You remember that old expression, go to work on an egg? Well, how about going to work in an egg? This extraordinary vehicle is the Toyota Previa, and it's their replacement for the very successful Space Cruiser. If you want to give a lift to eight close friends, plus their luggage, this vehicle can do it. And they'll sit on two benches rather than an old bench and armchair design. But it isn't just on the outside that this looks strange and different. There's some amazing technical innovations too. You'd never guess, for instance, that the engine is at an angle of 15 degrees, practically underneath the driver's seat, so this is almost a mid-engine car. So if the engine's under the driver's seat, I hear you ask, how do you get to it? Well, the answer is that they run a drive shaft forward through under the bonnet, which powers the fan, alternator, water pump, and power steering pump. And all the main reservoirs are here as well, so you can get at the water, the fluids, and the oil. So you don't have to worry that you're going to get garage bills just to check your oil levels. The old Space Cruiser was criticised for its handling, but this is much improved. That mid-engine helps, as does all-round suspension. And despite its size, the all-round visibility is pretty good too. And as a safety factor, none of the passengers in the back can get out on the driver's side because there aren't any doors there. But if this is a car for the future that's actually on sale now, another Japanese company has been looking at the same concept, but very much for the 21st century. Geisha, a word that conjures up images of traditional Japan. However, this is not the geisha. This is the geisha, once a method of transportation for nobles and officials. It was pulled by oxen and people. Mazda have taken the concept one stage further, and here we have a futuristic people carrier. It'll take six adults, four adults plus two children and loads of luggage. It's got four-wheel steering and four-wheel drive. They say that it shuns the concept that if it's spacious, it has to look like a box. Well, now, thanks to Mazda's Geisha, you'll be able to boast to the neighbours that you've got a triple rotary wankle, because the engine produces over 200 brake horsepower. Mazda are very keen to really establish themselves in the prestige car sector, and many of the features on the Geisha will be seen in models that they will be introducing in the future. Aston launched the Virage at Birmingham, but this year they're launching the Virage Volante. The B7 
beautifully sleek lines of this car can only be enjoyed by you and your passenger. It's strictly two-seater, this. The hood is fully automatic, powered by hydraulics, and there are even little motors that slot it into the header rail, so you don't have to do any work at all. And they've made the chassis 40% stiffer to compensate for the loss of the roof panel, which is a comfort, isn't it? It's powered by the 32-valve version of the Aston all-alloy V8 engine. That's 330 brake horsepower for you. But if you like the feel of driving along with the roof down and the wind in your hair, have a word with your hairdresser first, because it tends to get a bit blown about at 155 miles per hour. And you, I don't think that's going to bother the sort of people who can afford £150,000, which is what this car's going to cost you. Don't you think they usually tend to be short, fat and bald? Production of the Volante will start next year with the first deliveries in late summer. And let me leave you with this consoling thought. If you're short, fat, bald, but you can't quite stretch to 150,000, Aston have thoughtfully come up with this scaled-down version. It's an absolute bargain at only 18,000. Well, there may be depression in certain sectors of the UK car industry, but here on the BMW stand, there's certainly optimism. They're looking forward next year to the introduction of the new 3 Series. And here it is, the all-new 850 Coupe, in a delightful Mauritius blue with a very attractive silver-grey interior. And it absolutely oozes with BMW's stylish simplicity. The seat belt is integral with the back of the driver's seat. Anyone exiting from the rear of the car doesn't catch their foot and fall out. For the first time ever on a BMW, there's electronic control of the rake of the steering wheel, and that is linked to the memory of the seat. As you'd expect, there's ABS, automatic damping control, automatic traction control, and the heart of the matter is a 5-litre V12 engine delivering 300 horsepower. You've got the option of a four-speed automatic box, so if you really want to work hard, there's a six-speed manual. And what will she do, mister? Well, they've put a chip under the bonnet, limiting it to 155 miles an hour. But who decides that 155 is safe? Ten years ago, the Audi Quattro burst on the rally scene. Well, now this is the latest in a long line of subsequent Quattros, which, for me at any rate, are becoming rather confusing with their nomenclature. This is the Audi Coupe S2. On the outside, there's very little to tell it apart from an ordinary coupe. It's got attractive five-spoke alloy wheels, very big fat tyres and a different grille. But under the bonnet is the turbocharged 220 brake horsepower engine from the original Quattro Coupe. That gives it the best performance any Audi has ever had. 154 miles an hour flat out, 0 to 60 around about 5.7 seconds. Now if that frightens you, well don't uh, be too afraid. It's also got tremendous safety reserves, anti-lock brakes, the Procon 10 system that pulls the steering wheel away from you and automatically tightens the belts in the event of an accident. One thing that uh, enthusiasts will be able to tell it from the uh, original coupe is this tremendous performance when you come down a year. He always drives like that, particularly on test tracks and in other people's vehicles. Now, one of the cars that's currently reversing the trend in downward sales figures is Rover's 200 series. The waiting lists are already rather long and they're set to get longer with the introduction of the three-door range. There are four models in the range. Two of them have the 1.4-litre engine and then two with a 1.6-litre unit. This car has got the twin-cam fuel-injected 16-valve Honda engine giving it an incredible 130 brake horsepower. And to further endorse the competition image of the GTI, Rover Group have just announced the creation of its own racing championship. And 30 identical cars will be competing at UK circuits and on the continent, doing their panel-beating best to entertain the crowds. Now, if the three-door isn't really practical for you, what about the five-door that was launched in July? This model is already selling so well that if you want to buy one, you'll have to wait upwards of 12 weeks. However, you could win one in our Top Gear Radio Times competition. The Rover is one of two cars on offer. The other is a limited edition Mini Cooper. And I hasten to add, no, it's not the one that I was driving at the beginning of the show. You will need a copy of the new Radio Times on sale today. And the competition involves you identifying famous places and 
famous cars, taking the first letters and jiggling them all around, and you could become a Rover owner or flash about in a limited edition Mini Cooper. Good luck. Volkswagen Polo has been around for 15 years now, no less, and in that time, an astonishing 2.8 million of them have been sold. Now comes the launch of a new Polo. Well, it's certainly a new look Polo. It's had quite a facelift. There are new body panels, front and rear, new bumpers. It's altogether more aerodynamically sound. The range is wider, too, from the booted saloon there through to the little hatchback. And in two years' time, apparently, Volkswagen are going to launch a completely new version of this car. But for me, the real interest doesn't just lie in the new styling. It's in this area here, down by the exhaust. It's very refreshing in an age where car companies tend to make extravagant claims for style and performance, that Volkswagen are making claims for cleanness and safety. They say this is the first full range of small cars that are going to be fitted with catalytic converters and fuel injection as standard. So it's curtains for the carburettor as far as Volkswagen are concerned. Inside the Polo is looking smarter too. There's a new dashboard design, altogether much more stylish, with a new suspension setting, and perhaps most important, there's a new brake servo. Good news for the lighter foot. In other words, us women drivers have been complaining about it for the last 15 years. I think they'd have done something about it a bit sooner if it had been the men. These will all be on the road from mid-November. Now, this is the new five-door Land Rover Discovery. And before I say anything about it, can I say in my own defence, I do find it very difficult to criticise cars in this sector, off-road vehicles, because the buying decision is going to be based upon what you want the vehicle to do. And let's face it, they're very versatile. Do you want it to tow? Do you want to be able to put the hood down and pose? Or do you, in fact, simply like the fact that you're sitting up very, very high and you can feel a bit superior to other road users? There's also another consideration. Is it going to be the only car that you operate, or will your finances run to more than one vehicle? In which case, I have to say that for me, the Land Rover Discovery is the ultimate family car, and I would be very happy to think of my wife with the children on the worst winter's evening driving a car like this. You feel as if you're in command, sitting hopefully above the spray. You feel solid as if you've got a lot of metal around you, the kids strapped in in the back. The five doors means you've got greater accessibility now. If you want to take anyone else for a ride, then you can open the back door and there's two more seats there. They've got their own belts with them. They're extremely well designed. Uh, not 100% happy with the styling of the Discovery. I quite like the body shape, but it does seem to be an awfully long way off the ground. There's a lot of air in those wheel arches, and I think even if it means you have to forsake some of its off-road capability, I'd quite like to see it sitting a little lower. But having said that, let's face it, most people that buy cars like this never get them muddy, and if they do go off-road, they're hardly ever likely to explore its full capability. Another potential threat to the Range Rover comes from Mercedes. In the past, the old G-Wagon was considered too basic a vehicle to be a proper competitor. Now they've given it new petrol and diesel engines, permanent four-wheel drive system, and inside here, they've completely gutted the car. Apart from these three rather odd switches on the dashboard, an upright seating position, and a distinctly commanding view of the road ahead, you might be forgiven for thinking you're in a standard Mercedes saloon car. Of course, you wouldn't be too far wrong. They've taken the trim from the 300 models and applied it to the G-Wagon. That means you get nice, comfortable seats with armrests, you get the leather and wood trim, and you get a, a sunshine roof for the first time on this vehicle. You also get the option of air conditioning if you want it. The whole feeling is of a vehicle much more akin to the Range Rover than the previous wagon that you could clean out with a hose pipe if you got it muddy. But what it has retained is its off-road capability. Because it's got electronic control of the front, center, and rear diffs with these switches, it really can wade through the deepest mud. And now that it's got permanent four-wheel drive, Mercedes are also able to offer, for the first time, ABS on the G-Wagon. It's about time every car at the show was equipped with it. Well, if you think the G-Wagon is a bit on the small side, how about this? This is Renault's new Magnum truck. And at 503 horsepower, it's the highest powered truck on the European market. Obviously, by the climb up. 
Well, apart from all that horsepower, the first thing you notice is the space in here. It's big enough to live in, and of course the drivers do. It's got a flat floor, room for a double bunk, and a lot of headroom, which Renault have achieved by taking a space that's normally occupied either by air or by aerodynamic fairings and converting it into headspace. And by rounding off the corners, they reckon they've still kept it aerodynamically sound. Well, that's all very well if you've got the odd 63,000 to spend on a new truck. But if you'd like to make some adjustments to your existing fleet, how about getting them the body kit treatment? And this truck has had the full works with the side skirts, the front air dam, and perhaps most importantly, the smoothing of this area between the cab and the box. In road trials, this little dot has given fuel-saving results of between 20 and 25%, which could mean that the kit pays for itself inside as little as two years. Trucks, of course, have got a vital job of work to do. The trouble is, they tend to be the things you're stuck behind when they're clogging up the town's traffic. But this concept offers a very neat solution. This truck and trailer can carry four small boxes, which can be easily and swiftly unloaded to be collected by a small, town-friendly sized van all ready for local delivery. Now, isn't that a good idea? Let's hope it catches on. Back in 1973, one of Britain's leading industrial figures, George Turnbull, went to Korea to help them establish their new motor industry. Now, the plant that he helped set up produced the Pony Car, and it first came to Britain in 1982. Now there's a, a new range from Hyundai, the X2s. They come as five-door hatchbacks, three-door hatchbacks, and four-door saloons. They're powered by 1.3 and 1.5-litre engines derived from Mitsubishi, and there's a new range of transmissions, four-speed on the 1.3 and a five-speed on the 1.5. There's also a new four-speed automatic transmission that makes motorway cruising a bit more relaxed. Now, the 1.5 has multi-point fuel injection, and that means it gets catalytic converters as standard. In July, they introduced the S Coupe model, very nice lines, a high level of equipment, power steering as standard, and all for under £10,000. Small wonder they say they're sold out for the rest of this year. The Malaysian car company Proton has made the most amazing inroads into the car market since their launch at the Motor Show in 1988. They now hold a half percent of the British market, and that's more than Jaguar or Saab, but all that from a cold start. And the second generation of these cars are going to be launched next January. It's not remarkably different from the cars that are on the road now. The engine's slightly more powerful, a little quieter. It's a new front grille, but alas, still the old badge. Let's see what they've done inside. Well, it looks as though Proton have been listening to some of the criticisms that were levelled at them when they launched. It isn't nearly so plasticky in here. The seats have been remodelled too. They're a lot more comfortable. There's a new central console and a new steering wheel. On the 1.5 model, you get power-assisted steering. But there aren't a lot of extras with these cars, but they are still bargain prices. After all, if you can get a top-of-the-range one of these for under £9,000, Proton looks set to hold on to that healthy slice of the car market. With the total car market quite a long way down, the executive sector will be facing some particularly bitter battles in the coming months. And you might have expected a manufacturer with a new product in the sector to be rather nervous. Peugeot seemed quite confident about their new 605. After all, they've had a lot of experience of it in France, where it was launched almost a year ago. They tell me the trouble's been getting an automatic gearbox for it in this market. Now, the specifications range widely from 16,600 for the base model with a 2-litre fuel injection engine and 5-speed gearbox. But the higher specification cars are very sophisticated. For another £10,000, you can have the top of the range, a 3-litre V6, 24-valve, developing 200 brake horsepower. And inside, real luxury. Inside, you get a nice leather interior and a, a little touch of traditional wood. Sophisticated stereo system and a nice uh, heating climate control, which incorporates air conditioning. Cruise control and electric seats as part of the package. Not quite as luxurious as the old 604 model, but uh, that said, very nice indeed. 
Now, Peugeot used to share their V6 engine with Volvo, but Volvo have gone for a new straight six in their new model. The 900 series will replace the 700 series at the upper and the middle ends of the market. The main external difference really is a new, more rounded rear with revised lighting and a new bumper. It looks less severe, rather smoother, but still distinctively Volvo. It'll be available in estate form as well as saloon, and it goes on sale next month. Only the 740 GL models with the more angular rear end will remain in the company's 1991 lineup. There are now three new engine options, 2.1, 2.3, and a new 3-litre. And there's a new four-speed automatic gearbox, too, with three settings, winter, sport, and economy. Stopping power has been improved by new, larger disc brakes, and the designers have increased the headroom by a huge 20 millimetres, that's the width of a pound coin, and reduced the drag figure to 0.35, which gives a much softer, but some might say blander look. The exterior, though, is notably lacking in too much black trim or other styling gimmicks. But then you wouldn't really expect those of Volvo, would you? There aren't any major changes inside. It retains all the well-tried safety and comfort features. All the petrol engine cars are fitted with Volvo's special catalytic converter system called Lambda Fond. The 960 offers the all-new aluminium 3-litre 24-valve developing a very quiet 204 bhp but it also has an integral child safety seat fitted in the back. The boot's got the new flat floor and increased luggage space. Altogether, it's a less angular and much more refined look. The prices range from £16,725 to over £28,000 for the 960. There's nothing surprising here, but Volvo drivers are going to love it. So what's the difference between the elegant mountain bike and the car? Well, the answer is just one pound. 2,999 buys you the least expensive car at the show, the Yugo Tempo. Originally, they were going to make a limited edition of 500. Now they've extended the offer to the end of the month. Oh, and the bike, well, that was uh, designed by Audi rally champion Walter Rohl. It's all titanium, and it's yours for just 3,000 pounds as a listed Audi accessory. Well, we can't match that Yugo price here on the Skoda stand, but I can offer you a piece of motoring history because this car is unique. It's the first time ever that an Eastern European manufacturer has exhibited a prototype at a Western show. This is the Favorite Roadster. It's the only one in existence, but next year they say they're going to make 150 are destined for the UK market. No price at the moment, but it's going to be competitive. And that's certainly what Skoda have been on the international rally scene. In the last 17 years of the RAC rally, they've had 17 class wins. And this is the Favorite Group N rally car that's going to be driven this year by Steve Wedgbury. And another model on the stand is the all-new Favorite five-door estate. Finally, there's the Favorite Forum, a baseline model that's available for £4,697. And no doubt the real Skoda fans will be very sad to see the stand this year because these are all front-wheel drive cars. Skoda ceased production of the rear-wheel drive models earlier this year. Yeah, it's Citroen, it's another rally story, and you can't really miss this, can you? It's a very eye-catching and special version of the ZX, and it's going to be the company's challenge for the Paris-Dakar. And when I say special, have a look inside, I'll show you what I mean. Well, it's hardly your average family saloon in here, is it? It's going to be driven by Ari Vassanin, who's already been successful in it. He won the Baja Aragon Rally in California in July with Bruno Bergland as his co-driver. That's the rally that Steve McQueen used to go in for, by the way. Everything on the dashboard is very thoughtfully labelled. The only trouble is that you have to be a rally driver to know what it all means. The engine's based on Peugeot's 320 brake horsepower four-wheel drive car, and it needs to be solidly built under here because that Paris-Dakar rally is raced over 6,000 very gruelling miles. The body shape gives some indication of how the new ZX will look when it's introduced, and it comes in the range somewhere between the AX and the BX. A bit like the old GS, really, although I think if you put this one on the road next to the old GS, you'd know it's almost a rally car. Mm -hmm. For many people, this area houses the car of the show, and Honda are obviously very confident in the NSX because they've given it this air-conditioned gallery. 
It seems to me that it was only yesterday that Honda was all about motorcycles and small family cars, but they now are indeed a major force in the world of performance motoring. That has to be helped, of course, by their dominance in the world of Formula One. And when they set out to create this motor car, the NSX, they wanted to make the world's first truly practical supercar. It is built almost exclusively from aluminium. They're going there for strength, but for lightness. Indeed, just behind me on the stand, there is a chassis with its suspension entirely constructed from aluminium. You could be forgiven for believing the only bits that aren't aluminium are the tires and the interior trim. When it came to the engine, Honda decided to put it amidships, and they resisted the temptation to go for multi-cylinders and turbocharging. This is a 24-valve V6, 3-litre engine, pushing out 274 horsepower. Of course, the big disadvantage of having the engine in the middle here is that there isn't a lot of room for luggage. Having said that, the NSX has got quite a reasonable boot in the back, and of course there is an area at the front that's got a certain amount of room in it. Mind you, it's only got a space saver wheel, and that is actually deflated. There's a pump arrangement that allows you to blow it up. The equipment on the other side is for the uh, anti-lock braking system, and this car has an individual system on each of its wheels. From the moment that you sink into the beautiful leather interior, you realize that the Honda engineers have achieved their aim of creating a truly practical supercar. It's so easy to see out. There are no swollen wheel arches that make driving in traffic so difficult. The steering is light and responsive. This is not some exotic muscle car that's actually got to be tamed. After all, it's even got a cruise control and you can have it automatic if you want. I think they've got an absolute winner here. I'm certain of it. You won't be able to buy one until 1992. If you want it then, it's going to cost you £52,000. And I wonder how much of a premium the speculators will put on top of that. But what a car. Over 165 miles an hour, 0 to 60 in under 5 seconds. They must have a winner. Amongst all this gloss and glitter, isn't it nice to see an old design like this one? This is a new vehicle, of course, but Asquith are using a style that was popular during what some people might think were the good old days of motoring. I'm not so sure. I think at this year's motor show, we've seen more exciting and possibly more new cars than ever before. I'll be back at the same time next week with the rest of the Top Gear team for the first of our new autumn series of 10 programmes. That Honda's good. I told you you'd like it. That's true, that's true. And if your appetite is still not satisfied, we've got another motor show feast for you. It's coming Sunday at 5.20 on BBC One. Ding, ding, full ahead, driver. Only time.